So thank you very much. Uh, please do keep in touch. Uh, because I work in the area of marketing, then we always um, are really shameless about saying that we want to keep in touch. We want more eyeballs. We want some dialogue. And that's why I put my details there. And the reason I've got my uh, photograph there is purely and simply because I realized that as a marketer, one of the, the coolest things you can do is to give away all of your materials. So if you see anything that you like, you can have it. Um, I've just put my face and my name next to things as a kind of insurance mechanism so that people know it's my stuff. But um, I'm gonna, I've got 15 minutes, right? So I can't change the world in 15 minutes, although Donald Trump kind of did that in a couple of minutes. But um, in my 15 minutes, I want to show you some things that are interesting to me and have been interesting over there. Uh, the past year, and hopefully we can have some interesting discussions on those things. Now, since we were talking about the US, you've got to think about it like this, and I know that you'll love these stats. One in 10 in the US go online exclusively through mobile phones. Now, even more interestingly is three quarters of people admit to checking their phone on the toilet in the US, and they wonder about politics in the US, right? I'm not gonna ask you guys how many of you check um, your phone when you're on the toilet. I'm not gonna ask you guys how many of you reply to emails from your boss when you're on the toilet, as opposed to the people that you love. There might be a difference in that, right? I mean, who do you text when you're on the tube as opposed to who do you text when you're on the throne as opposed to who do you text when you're watching Game of Thrones? Um, there's a slight difference. But even more interestingly, people receive calls on the toilet and initiate calls other than the call of nature on the toilet. Now, this is quite an interesting start because think about the, over the past 10 years how things have changed. How old is YouTube? It's 10 years old. When did iPhones first come out? Was it 2007? 2007. Not so long ago, right? So if you think about the reality that we're in now, smartphones, smart thumbs, smart mouths, smart minds, smart technology, everything converging through a mobile phone device. When previously, you had, what, Discmans or Walkmans or MP3 players, you had your camera, you had your phone, you had your uh, audio player. You know, lots of things have changed in a, in a relatively short space of time. And at the other spectrum, what has changed? I mean, I kind of grew up on a diet of grunge music and hip-hop in the 90s, and so I remember in the 90s it was cool to have big headphones, uh, but for the rest of the world it wasn't cool. And so it's really strange that I've moved to in-ear headphones, and I see everyone uh, wearing big headphones from Beats by Dre, which is kind of mind-blowing, really, that people are kind of accepting an entrepreneur such as Dr. Dre and maybe if they'd grown up on straight out of Compton or something like that, or you know, that maybe they wouldn't, they wouldn't see things the same way. But we're seeing some really interesting things happen. Uh, you know, before Trump got elected, I remember a few years ago, sticking on the US, I remember telling people in America that the fact that they got rid of Saddam Hussein and they appointed Barack Hussein Obama was insane. I didn't think it could get any more crazy than having Obama uh, after getting rid of Saddam Hussein with the middle name Hussein, but then we've got Trump, right? Um, loads more gag material. So in the US, mobile devices are important and influential in every facet of life, and it's changed the way that people behave. Now, if we think about the UK, we can see that there are differences with regards to age brackets, but mobile is still important. Think about that for one minute. How many of you only use the mobile, only, only use a mobile phone to check the internet? because you're, you know, professional educated people, right? You need something a bit more powerful. All right, so how many of you have migrated away from tower computers and now have this existence of a laptop? Right, I never thought that I'd rely upon a laptop. I used to be a tower person, now I've got a laptop that you can, you know, this thing, I never switch off, right? It kind of, it just, it just goes to sleep. I can plug it into big monitors, small monitors, it does lots of things for me. And then there's that thing in between called a tablet that I'm not sure what I should do with, um, but it kind of sits in my bag anyway, right? So we have a situation where we've moved away from a piece of technology such as a tower, 
and we've moved more towards mobiles. I, I realize that I use my mobile phone a lot, um, especially for research. You know, I take pictures, the time, the date stamped, the location stamped, and I don't use a camera very much other than the one on my phone because I can share things quickly, right? You can take pictures and you can share them with people. And most recently, I've been doing some work with the Indonesian government, um, and it surprised me to know that their number one mode of communication to me is WhatsApp. Or Line, because Line's got better stickers. So I want you to think about the fact that government ministers actually like to answer questions with stickers. I had a discussion with colleagues and said that maybe in the future, universities might uh, move away from grade classifications to emojis, right? <laughs> might work. So if the internet is everywhere and it's through mobile devices and we're all converging towards this thing, currently we're in a situation where you read articles or you go to university courses where they talk about digital marketing or online marketing or social media marketing. And when I look at textbooks, they kind of have it, a chapter on this thing. But in our existence, we use it all the time. There isn't this thing. You don't switch on the internet and switch off the internet, right? It's everywhere. And so within industry, there are some advertising agencies and marketing agencies that have decided to get rid of the term digital because everything is digital. So if that's the case, and as is put here, it's like air and drinking water, I think that's quite interesting. But even more interesting was um, I was talking to this, um, he was the former Grand Mufti of Bosnia for 20 years, and, and he made a comment where he said, in his generation, water was free and you paid for music, and now uh, you pay for water and music is free. Well, actually, you're supposed to pay for music, aren't you? Apple Music, Spotify, unless you go on BitTorrent. But the idea is that there are lots of things where things are being turned up upside down. And things like internet and virtual reality and our consumption are everywhere. And with information everywhere, ubiquitous information that levels the playing field, no longer do you have to think that there are these libraries that are have uh, restricted access. You know, you can find out anything about anybody. And um, I was saying to a class this morning that I prided myself on watching Lewis Hamilton get his title last year in Formula One with a browser window open on Wikipedia to see how quickly it takes Wikipedia to update its profile. Well, actually, it was almost instantaneous. Yeah, if you're bored, try that one. It's quite fun. Or think about how Google uh, can tell you various things. I had a, an interview with Google, and they can tell you where a cold virus starts purely through search. When you're watching television and you're watching Question Time or whatever, and you think, who is that old git there? And you type in their name, and it says, did you mean this person? Yes, I did. And even more scary is when you type in a few letters of somebody uh, from school, and they say, you mean this person, don't you? Well, how do you know? <laughs> Google knows quite a lot. It's also quite fun to go on holiday and search for things because you, you get access to different web pages. So I, I learned that um, I was looking for something, and then if I'm in, in, in Asia, for example, then there are, there are pictures of me pulling stupid selfie faces and peace signs that, that we don't get in London. Um, but the idea is then that you have this information which is everywhere that everybody has access to. But what is the impact on an entrepreneur? And this is really what I wanted to tackle today. Because if we look at a country like Indonesia, and I'm currently doing some work with the Ministry of Tourism in Indonesia, and just to fill you in, Indonesia has 257 million people. It's the most populous Muslim country on the planet with about 220 million. It has 17,500 islands. It's kind of big, right? And within Indonesia, you've got a situation where data plans are cheap. Two-thirds of the people accessing the internet are using it through a mobile device. You've also got the greatest number of people anywhere pimping the, yeah, you can see how I write in the Huffington Post, pimping their phones with stickers, right? As in, does everyone know what a sticker is? Right, so you've all sent each other a sticker. Good. My dean didn't until this week. Um, so people are sending stickers. People are tweeting. It's the third largest number of Facebook users globally, right? And if you think about the top 10 tweeting nations, I think I've got a slide on that. Jakarta is number one. Jakarta is in Indonesia. Bandung at number six is also in Indonesia. And then you've got places like Riyadh from Saudi Arabia at number 10. Now, if you watch Fox News or whatever, then you might think that these conservative countries don't talk, don't use social media, don't express themselves 
through these channels. But then if you look here, it's quite an eclectic mix of Indonesia and Japan and London and Brazil and the United States of America and France. Tweeting, talking about goodness knows what. And if we go back to the Indonesian slide, it's the fact that more people have mobile phones than bank accounts is the thing that blew my mind. And now we want to think about what an entrepreneur means. You want to have a bank account? You want to target people that can uh, facilitate online transactions? Or are we going to actually come and do business? And the number one vehicle for doing business is through a mobile phone. And if we think about in emerging economies where they are recycling mobile phones, there are places in Africa where they have mobile phones and internet access, but it's just text. You know, we don't have any GIFs, we don't have any memes, but we can now see that phones are being recycled, yeah, in such a way that the penetration for the mobile phone is immense. The opportunities, therefore, should be immense for entrepreneurs, right? So, if everyone is tweeting, and everyone is talking about social media, what is social media about? Is it about being sociable? Can it be used for any other purpose? My first disclaimer and apology is this. When I was looking for images for this slide, you can see it's a, it's, a, um, it's a slide full of men. Actually, the internet is about femininity and it's about women. I think if you think about the psychology behind communication, who else is better equipped at communicating regularly, frequently, in a polite and courteous fashion? If we think about the old style of marketing, broadcasting, dominating, commanding people to buy their products, and the old way of behavior, which I think, you know, once upon a time, if I said to my friend, I'll meet them in two weeks' time outside HMV Records, I will meet them in two weeks' time outside HMV Records unless I phone you otherwise. Now, in today's reality, it's this whole love affair that I'm, I'm, I think I'm almost used to now, which is, can't wait to see you next week, and what are you doing? On the bus, just got on the bus, five minutes away, oops, lol, not five minutes anymore, there's leaves on the track. But all of this is a mechanism by which people are forging friendship bonds. But at the same time, there's one question that I asked you know, some of my students, which is, if you saw the most beautiful person in the world and they had agreed to see you on a date, how long would you wait for them outside HMV record store? Now, I think once upon a time, I would have waited one hour, 45 minutes quite happily. Uh, today, people with Wi-Fi and the whole access to information and worlds and video stations and downloadable music wouldn't wait one hour, 45 minutes for the person that they love. So we have changed in some ways. We have access to things, but our attention span is incredibly short. And we still have to break through barriers, which whilst there are all of these platforms, we can still see that when it comes to the tech space and entrepreneurism, it's still portrayed as being largely men and largely Western white men. So if social media is about a global phenomenon where everyone is communicating, and it's about talking to everybody, and entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, how do we break through? Well, if I gave you the boring business approach to classifying people, which I think is also important, really there are three things that you can define people by in terms of stakeholders. Power, legitimacy, and urgency. That's all you need to decide who you should interact with and who is less of a problem. Now, the change from this theory that came out in 97 is that I would say, who defines what legitimacy is? I mean, now, you can be a reality TV judge on The Apprentice, and you can become president of the United States of America, right? I mean, where's the legitimacy in that, right? Or you can, in the next five minutes, buy a domain name and become CEO of your own company, right? Buy a domain name, set up a web page, give yourself a job title, and you can legitimately become CEO of your own company. Or you could get a blog with the Huffington Post or any other newspaper, and you could legitimately be reporting as a journalist without being qualified. Citizen journalism, right? So stakeholder theory is the same. How it's playing out has changed, and brands are at the center of that change. Because I think that brands are the things which are defining the way that we communicate in a way which is clear, consistent, stands out, where, you know, we're resource rich and time poor. 
So we talk in brand language. I think the most extreme case of that was where I had a student who said, I'm just going to Nike this, which meant I'm just going to do it. Yeah, well, that's what you get, Americans, right? <laughs> just Nike it. Right? But a brand then, from my context, is a container in which you put information in. If I was to help you create your own personal brand, if you wanted to go down that route, I would say, get a box or a piece of paper, put everything that you like and is important to you in that box. If that's Nando's, if that's double apple shisha tobacco, if that's Arsenal football shirts, if that's you know, a box set of, uh, give me a box set that you like. What's your favorite box set? What do you binge watch? Do you, I want to know what Alan binge watches. I've got a whole hard drive full of things I should binge on, but you know, I'm still, I'm still thin. Come on, the camera's rolling. You don't binge watch? Oh. You don't know what you're missing. <laughs> okay. Let's say you were to binge watch, I don't know, uh, what should we pick? I can pick anything for you now, do you realize? Is your house of cards got? Yeah, I think you'd like House of Cards, actually. I binge-watched it on the plane. Okay, so Prof. Alam's going to binge-watch House of Cards along with Nando's and Double Apple Shisha Tobacco and Arsenal Football Club. We can see that now we have an emotive personal brand, something that people can connect with in the modern space. So how I would then arrange these things in terms of stakeholder theory is that brands are the center of everything, and we oscillate around almost like a molecule in different states. You can be a gatekeeper, you can become a consumer. You can see here that there are social networkers who donate, and this is why I use the word donor. They donate some of their equity towards a brand, but we have these kind of bonds which oscillate and fuse us towards people and also allow us to be repelled. Now, if you want to know more about that, I can send you a whole chapter. Um, so you've got my email details, by all means email me. But really what I want to focus on is this idea then of what it means today in terms of sustainability and entrepreneurship and links to economics. Because when I go to Japan and I see people dressed like this, that doesn't appear to me to be rational man theory. Where is the rationality in how many hair clips you have in your hair? I don't understand. Explain to me the science of uh, the sticking plaster over the nose. You know, now I sound like somebody's uncle. It's a bit like when you come home and somebody says, son, why did you spend all of your money on those things? Well, you, know, you, can, well, you can't make sense of it, dad or uncle or mom or something. Um, because human beings are kind of sensibly nonsensical, if that makes sense. The idea is that we chase moments and emotions, and we can rationalize those moments and emotions, but those things are inherently perishable, and the most attractive emotions and the most attractive artifacts and products and services are the ones which are difficult to replicate. But the challenge for a business is how do you maintain the balance of replication at scale? So, add to that mix, who's watched Robocop, the, the remake of Robocop? Okay, so then there's an ethical dilemma here. Who is controlling you? If we look at transhumanism, they will tell you that flesh is futile humans are going to be replaced by robots and androids who are the superior creation, right? They're the sorts of people that would willingly have their arm amputated in replacement for a bionic arm. I mean, who wouldn't, right? Um, but the idea is that we haven't quite worked out where, what our role is with technology, how technology helps us rather than sends us crazy, right? Because I've made some jokes and, and social media is fun and the internet is fun, and meeting people is fun, but how do you protect yourself from going mentally insane? If your phone is always on, if you're connected with people all over the world, if you see natural disasters, unnatural disasters, pain, suffering, loss, torment, every second of the day in every nation all around the world, I think this is gonna be one of the biggest challenges that we have to face. And then you wanna sell some product to become an entrepreneur of the year. It's kind of tough, right? So, to kind of wrap up in some ways, I think the challenge for entrepreneurs, particularly in emerging markets, and those with social enterprises, is when do you have the time to actually give branding and social media the care, love, and attention that they deserve? Because on one level, an entrepreneur and a social entrepreneur are kicking back against the corporate ideal of what it is to do business, right? That's the whole reason for, for wanting to do things your own way. You don't want to work for somebody, you want to work for yourself. 
You want to make a change. You don't want to be like the big corporate. But big corporates have spent a lot of time doing marketing and branding and social media, and they're very good at it. And they've acquired a lot of equity. And it's often easy for you then to reject not just the business model, but actually some of the good things with regards running and social media. So really what I'm trying to say is that I'm here to kind of wave a flag in some respects to say that if you are going to be an entrepreneur and you want to uh, be engaged in social enterprises, please don't neglect the fact that actually branding is really important. Social media is really important. And mobile technology is really important. And if you understand that, then Okay, I've got a booster pack. You can almost run your business from this. Most of my important details, information, contacts, interactions occur just through this little device. So, if that's the case and you want to make change, please use branding and social media and think about a way in which you have to basically control each of these spaces. It's about claiming a space, creating a space, allowing people to gather and congregate, allowing people to co collaborate, to communicate, but ultimately to control. But you can't control these things unless you make it a really nice, enjoyable space that everyone's to participate in. One of the things that we kick back against, especially with entrepreneurs in social enterprise, is this idea that companies want to control and dominate. And I'm guessing that most people in this room don't want to control and dominate. They just want to do something a little bit more smart, uh, for a little bit more um, equity and to make a little bit more of a change. So, two slides of top tips and then I think I have to pass the mic. I sound like um, Beastie Boys pass the mic, right, don't I? Okay, so if I pass the mic right, like the Beastie Boys did, then I need to give you some top tips. Social media. Really, social media is quite simple in the sense that you should come up with a strategy where you're saying lots of good things about lots of people more than you do about yourself. Most corporates lose the social media battle because they only talk about themselves. They don't know how to talk about other people. Can you imagine a situation where you spend 80% of your time saying good things about other people? If you can, then you're gonna have success in social media. Then that gives you permission to brag about whatever you want because it's 20% of what you do, right? So. I would actually actively apply that. If you think that, you know, whether you as a business or you as a personal brand, give it a shot. Say to yourself, okay, you know what, today I'm going to send out 10 messages. Eight of them are going to be saying good things about other people. No ifs, no buts, no backhanded well. If it wasn't for me, that person wouldn't be a superstar. Just amazing things. Then give yourself permission to say two good things about yourself. And I get you, I get it. You won't have any kickback. Now, the other thing you have to do, though, is to teach rather than preach. It's all too easy on social media to join the caravan of people that evangelize and tell people what to do, either in a childish way or in a very patronizing way. And this is also a challenge for businesses, which is when they try and be mature and adult, people forget that in social media. You get lost. More often than not, companies try to dominate conversation by saying, well, what do you know? Are you qualified to do this? We've been doing this for years. Um, kind of sounds like a gangster rap song, right? But you can't brag your way through social media. But what you can do is you can joke your way through social media. I mean, can you imagine um, a company that was able to say, oh, come on, we've been working really hard on this. Give us a break. Crying. I'm so upset that you don't like my product. That's really bad. I'm going to tell my mum, <laughs> right? Would probably get you out of a, a bad situation better than we've been working very hard. Or could you provide your qualifications? Have you ever done this before? Um, and there are some notable examples of companies that do work well on social media and do find that, that correct balance. But you have to work in real time. Don't think that you can open up your laptop once a week and then blow the dust off your social media campaign, right? This has to happen in real time. Things are going on all of the time. I mean, at the minute, I mean, I've, I've spared us from this, but uh, I've got a talk next, next month in Indonesia and I was on the phone to them yesterday, well, I was WhatsApping them yesterday saying, I want to do a mannequin challenge. Right? If you don't know what one is, then do a Google. I saw Hillary Clinton did one. And it was pretty good. I thought, if Hillary Clinton can do a mannequin challenge, obviously they don't necessarily succeed. But if she can do a mannequin challenge, I want to try and do a mannequin challenge in Indonesia where there's going to be like 4,000 people. Whether I can get 4,000 people to stay still and to do a good mannequin challenge, let's see. But that 
relies, therefore, upon capitalizing on things that are happening in real time and surfing a wave of trends. Or, if you want to put it another way, you have to find a way to put the human element in what it is that you do in business, and you have to give in the hope that you receive. If you give looking to receive, it doesn't work. Give in the hope that you will receive, and I'm sure you'll be able to do some good things. With that, my last slide, if you don't understand any of that or you don't buy into any of it, it's really simple. If you want to do good marketing, good branding, good social media, just remind yourself that humans are really simple. All that human beings care about is love. That's it. Whether they say that they do or they don't, doesn't matter. At the heart of them, human beings care about love. They want to love and be loved. Simple. Even if you become a heavyweight champion of the world and knock somebody out, something along the lines, somewhere, whether that's Freud or someone else, is going to tell you that your activities are a way of balancing your desire for love. Why do you stay up all night working on your assignment? Well, it's to be loved, isn't it? Or do you love working on your assignments? Why is it that it's so important for you to make a change in the world? Why are all of these things that you do, and there are lots of whys, we can go on all the time, but ultimately most of those things will map themselves somewhere back to a need to love and be loved. And so on that easy note to end on, I'd like to say thank you very much. And I'd love to have any questions. <laughs>